This video is brought to you by AudioQuest, makers of the Dragonfly range of USB DACs. Click to audioquest.com for more information. If there is such a thing as vintage digital audio, then I'm going to talk about it today because I want to pour one out for the Logitech Squeezebox Touch and its supporting software system. Because as we will see, this hardware and the associated software system can still cut it, and then some, in today's modern streaming music landscape. So the Squeezebox Touch was introduced by Logitech in 2010, four years after it acquired a company called Slim Devices. And Slim Devices had previously made network audio streamers, and I hope I get this right. There was the Slim MP3, then there was the Squeezebox, then the Squeezebox 2, Squeezebox 3, which I think was redubbed Classic. Then there was the Squeezebox Duet, which I didn't like, and I might talk about that in this video. And after that, yeah, Squeezebox Touch. And in between somewhere was the transporter. Now working in tandem with server software running on another device, like a PC, a Mac, or a Linux device, or even actually now a Raspberry Pi, the Squeezebox Touch allows us to stream local files over our network. But it also allows us to do things like Spotify Connect, it does Tidal, Cobas, Deezer, and a few others which we'll get to. And the main control interface is a web interface, but you can also use smartphone apps. You can also use the remote wand that is supplied with the Squeezebox Touch, although mine no longer works because the guy I bought it from forgot to take the batteries out before he put it into storage so that by the time it arrived at my house, they'd leaked everywhere. But I don't need that remote, not at all. But then, in 2012, Logitech just pulled the plug on the Squeezebox Touch. Bye bye, see you later, no more being made. And I think that caused a lot of frustration for people like me who were heavily invested in that platform because I love the Squeezebox platform, still do, as we'll see. Now, fortunately, Logitech still maintain a website called mysqueezebox.com, which facilitates the Tidal integration. It's a bit of a faff, really, but I almost said fiddle there. It's a bit of a faff and a fiddle but it is essential for the Tidal integration with this platform. And then the Logitech Media Server, which used to be called Squeezebox Server, and in between I think it was called Squeeze Center. But basically this, the backend software is now in the hands of the community, and it is community developed. And it too hasn't stood still, but it hasn't really kind of come on what you'd say leaps and bounds as it might have done were it still part of a commercial products ecosystem but it's being maintained and there are small updates here and there. I'll talk about some of those in a bit, but it's great that we can still download that Logitech media server. We can still install it on PCs, Macs, and Linux devices. Now the most obvious thing about the Squeezebox Touch is its 4.3 inch color touchscreen. And it only measures a few hundred pixels by a few hundred pixels. It's not especially high res, but I think at the time when it was introduced in 2010, it was pretty much cutting edge. And it's kind of good for displaying cover art and artist information, things like that. But if I'm honest, it's kind of hard to see from the listening position. But I would ask you to ask yourselves this, how many affordable network streamers that come to market today have a color touch screen on them? And if you're going to answer, well, what about the Raspberry Pi 7-inch touch screen? The problem with that is its viewing angle. The viewing angle on the Squeezebox touches screen is much wider 
than the Raspberry Pis. So I think in that respect, the touch wins out. But that touchscreen also solves Digital Audio's number one problem in that it gives us something to look at when we're playing music. And in this case, on the squeeze box touch, we don't just get cover art. We could also have the choice of a spectrum analyzer and some very dodgy looking VU meters, virtual VU meters. They're kind of cute by today's standards. I think at the time we were all like, wow, that's amazing, but not now. But it still gives us something to look at. I mean, I think I prefer the cover art or the spectrum analyzer these days. And of course, we can use that touchscreen to navigate the squeeze box touches internal menu system. But that's a little bit fiddly sometimes. Of course, if you don't want to do that, we can use third party smartphone apps. I use something called iPeng on the iPhone and the iPad. And then on my Android devices, I use something called Orange Squeeze. These are not the only apps available for controlling Squeezebox products, but those are the two main ones that I use. Now, it used to be that the web interface for controlling Squeezeboxes was, it was fairly sort of what you'd call nerdy or technical. And I think nowadays those original skins, I think they're called, would look a bit out of date. But one thing that has come to the Squeezebox platform in the last 10 years, I think it may be in even as recent as five years ago, is something called the Material Skin. You install it using a plugin in the back end in the plugin section. And then what it gives you is a much more sort of sleeker, faster, more, I guess a simpler interface on library navigation and cover art display. And then if you install the right plugins, you also get like artist bios and things like that. Some of the stuff that other streaming platforms give us. But what I like about the material skin is it's super quick and it works on mobile devices. So if you don't like any of the, the streaming apps that are available on the Google Play Store or the App Store, you can just fire up a browser and punch in whatever the IP address is of the server, colon 9000, and then you get a very fast and responsive, responsive means it collapses elegantly on a smaller screen and displays properly. And it's super zippy and I have actually used it and still use it. So I wouldn't discount the material skin because I think it's one of the best developments to come to the Squeezebox server platform since, yeah, since the, the touch was discontinued 10 years ago. 10 years ago, God. I'm going to sound like an old man now when I say, doesn't time fly? Other plugins in the back end also give us access to SoundCloud and MixCloud. And then there's also the section for Soma FM radio stations. My favorite being Groove Salad, but the early 2000s version of Groove Salad. Just a great little radio station. So that's obviously still baked into the platform. I don't think you need a plugin for that, but you do for Spotify, Cobas, Deezer, and then Tidal as well, but you have to log into mysqueezebox.com and set that up there. Like I said, it's a bit of a faff and a bit of a fiddle, but you only have to do it once. And then going back to the web interface, to browse Tidal or to search for things on Tidal. The search functionality is pretty basic, but it's fast, especially with the material skin. If we go back to the hardware on the Squeezebox Touch, on the back panel, there are digital audio outputs for coaxial and Toslink. There's also a USB socket. And if you install something called the Enhanced Digital Output Applet, then that USB socket can be enabled to talk to a USB DAC. So you could plug in an AudioQuest Dragonfly or something like that if you wanted to. I haven't done that because I'm just using the internal DAC inside the Squeezebox Touch and having that feed via a pair of RCA cables feed a preamplifier that I've got over here. It's actually the PS Audio and it's feeding a, 
what is it, a Peachtree GAN 400 power amplifier, which in turn is driving these Klipsch Forte 4 loudspeakers. But I've only just put these in for the benefit of this video because the sound comparisons that I'm about to talk about, the side-by-side -side comparisons that I'm about to talk about, were done with the PSB Passive 50 loudspeakers. So I compared the sound of the squeeze box touch using its analog outputs to the analog outputs found on the Blue Sound node, the N130 version from 2021. Now there isn't a night and day difference. There isn't even really much of a tiny audio file difference that I can magnify here. I guess if there's anything, I would say that the squeeze box touches sound has a little bit of a metallic sheen up top, which does help a little bit with perceived detail retrieval, but also with layer separation. But it's only a small amount. It's nothing huge. I mean, it does contrast the, the Blue Sound node is sounding a little bit warmer, maybe, a little bit more organic, you might say. And that means that the node to my mind and to my ears is better suited to music like that from Tom Waits or Nick Cave. And then maybe the Squeezebox Touch is better suited to electronic music by somebody like Mode Selector. But when I say that, it just makes it sound like there's a big difference and there really isn't. I'm just trying to highlight where there is a difference. and I'm really trying hard to pick it apart as best as I can, but it's, it's like this much. It's like half a percent difference. I guess the takeaway here is it's just that it's a super subtle difference. And that tells us that we are not stepping back to a dark age of digital audio sound wise when we cut from the blue sound to the Logitech. Not at all. Now, if you're thinking, well, hang on a minute, John, they no longer make the squeeze box touch. So where can I get one? Well, the answer is the second hand market. And I did a search just yesterday on Hi-Fi Shark and it returned 91 results worldwide. And the touches on there were selling from anything between 100 bucks and 250 bucks. But if you can't get one in your area, all is not lost because there is something called squeeze light, which is a little bit of software that basically emulates the functionality of a squeeze box touch in terms of the streaming endpoint. So you can install that on a Raspberry Pi. You can also install it actually on the same device that you put your Logitech media server on because there's a plugin in the back end that installs it there. So you could have a PC or a Mac that behaves as a squeeze box server and a squeeze box streamer. Or you could have just the, the PC or Mac as the server and then the Raspberry Pi running squeeze light as your endpoint. And we've made a video about this before. And in that video, I also showed that you can actually put Logitech media server onto the same Pi that runs squeeze light. So an all in one tiny little server streamer, which I think is fantastic. So you don't have to go and tear your hair out trying to find a good conditioned squeeze box touch. You don't have to, but it gets better than that because Logitech Media Server in its back end, in the plugin section, there are plugins that allow us to stream from the media server to Chromecast devices and to AirPlay devices. So I can stream to my Google TV or my Nvidia Shield Pro or my Apple TV from the Logitech Media Server using the smartphone apps or the web interface. So basically my Google TV or the Nvidia Shield Pro or the Apple TV become virtual squeeze boxing because they behave in the same way because Logitech Media Server kind of sees them functionally as the same thing as a squeeze box touch. And I guess the spicy finding here for Rune users, for Rune users who follow what I talk about with respect to Rune 2.0, is that you don't need an active internet connection to stream local files using the Logitech Media Server system. And that's kind of one of the reasons I went back to the Squeezebox Touch and why I set up this system again was basically so that I have a fail safe in case my internet goes bye bye for the afternoon. And it's also worth noting that even if you don't have Logitech Media Server set up, you can get your Rune server to stream to a Squeezebox Touch. So I think that's pretty awesome, although obviously that comes with the restrictions that Rune 2.0 applies to wanting an active internet connection. So at the moment, I've got Logitech Media Server installed on an old Windows laptop. But I think next week, I'm gonna move that over to a Raspberry Pi, plug it in, put it on the network, and then tuck it away out of sight. 
and then have that Logitech media server scan my Rune library, which is shared over Samba, over the network. And if you don't know what I just said or don't understand it, don't worry about it. So if you're picking up what I'm putting down here is that even after 10 years of no more squeeze box touches being made, the hardware and especially the supporting software system is still very much a streaming contender in the sort of modern streaming landscape that we deal with today because we can do most of, but not all of, the, the streaming services that many of us use like Spotify, Cobas, Deezer, Tidal, Mixcloud, SoundCloud. There's probably a couple of others that I've forgotten, but Squeezebox server itself is extremely flexible and, and it's free. It's a free download. So you could easily download that, get an old Raspberry Pi, slap Squeezelite on that, and all you've spent is whatever it costs the Raspberry Pi, although those are quite expensive right now, aren't they? They're quite hard to get, I think. So, but you could also use an old PC, an old Mac, and it doesn't even have to be very powerful, not at all. So this is very, I won't say it's easy to set up because for me, setting up all the plugins that I want and installing the material skin and getting all the layout how I want it takes a couple of hours, but it's a fun project and it's a fun project that's free. And it's very, very hard as a commercial streaming manufacturer or a developer of a commercial streaming platform to compete with free. But the Squeezebox Touches validity in 2022 also runs counter to a couple of ideas that I see knocking about basically in the comments section. And number one is that today's superstar streaming product is going to be tomorrow's paperweight. Clearly 10 years have elapsed since the, the Squeezebox Touch was discontinued and it's still a great product. It still stands up against rivals today as we've seen I guess sound-wise compared to the Blue Sound node. And the Squeezebox platform can do pretty much most of the streaming things that the node can do apart from two-way Bluetooth headphone socket. Now there is a headphone socket on the back of the Squeezebox Touch but I've never ever used it. And the Squeezebox Touch can itself operate as a, a Squeezebox server but I wouldn't necessarily do that if you've got a large library because it does seem to choke when trying to scan and process a large library. But the other thing that this whole system seems to contradict, the other idea, is that basically the, the streaming world is moving so quickly that we can't possibly keep up. And therefore, we've got to be very careful with how we spend our money on streaming equipment. And I don't think it is moving that quickly. I think the things that are inside a Squeezebox Touch were there 10 years ago even if Mixcloud and Soundcloud might have come on a little bit later. But I know that Spotify Connect was there, pretty sure Tidal was there, maybe Cobos was a bit later, maybe, as a plugin. But the streaming world doesn't move so quickly as to make the squeeze box touch and the surrounding software system completely redundant in 2022. Not at all. I suppose you're gonna to wanna to know about gapless playback, right? I mean, generally, my idea is that if I don't mention it, then it's obviously gapless because you know if it's gapped, I'm going to make a big song and dance about it. But Squeezebox playback of local files is gapless. And with Tidal, it is gapless. I haven't tested Cobas and I haven't tested Deezer. I don't know, but I would be amazed if it's not gapless. So I think you're pretty safe in that regard. And then what about comparisons to other network streamers? No idea. Sorry, I haven't done those. I just compared it to what I thought was the, possibly the definitive affordable network streaming device of this year, and that being the Blue Sound node. What about the Logitech Transporter? As I've said, I've got one, but that's not really the subject of this video. I might tackle it down the line, I might not, I don't know. But if you like my enthusiasm, my ongoing enthusiasm for the Squeezebox Touch, and if you dig the fact that I made this video not for you, I made it for me. I mean, yeah, obviously you're gonna watch it, 
but I've really made this because I wanted to celebrate the glory, the glory that is the Logitech Squeezebox Touch and by association Logitech Media Server. So if you dig that, then please consider giving this video a like. If you like my attitude to vintage digital audio products like the Squeezebox Touch, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Yeah, I said enhanced digital output applet. Now, this isn't a how-to video, not at all. So if you want to know how to install that, I'll put a link in the description box below because I wrote about this 10 years ago. I, when I was Googling for like this EDO applet, the first thing in Google was my own article about it. So yeah, it's still, still relevant to me.